Hope to see you soon in Bangkok. <laughs> Good okay, luck. Um, Thank you. Dr. Thiewood is our um, lead um, cancer leadership for BMS, uh, Watanosot Cancer Hospital, and the whole cancer network in BMS group of hospitals. So he is really looking forward to uh, your multidisciplinary team in colorectal treatment lecture today. Um, to start? Um, uh, do you want yes, me to Dr. Liana. You? Yeah. Yes, please. Should I introduce Adele a little bit? He is our medical oncologist extraordinaire. He runs our multidisciplinary tumor board. We meet every Thursday and we discuss all our cancer cases, GI related cancer cases. Um, he has done an amazing job. He's a researcher. He's a clinician scientist with a particular focus of research interest and focus on immunology uh, of cancers and uh, tumor microenvironment. Um, and he's going, I asked him to give us a talk today um, on how we run our multidisciplinary tumor board because we have found it to be one of the most effective ways uh, to personalize cancer care tailored to the patient, really personalized cancer care. And also he, um, He's a, you know, um, an expert in the anything new in ctDNA, and I'm looking forward to his talk today. Okay, well, thank you, Leanne. I really appreciate it. Um, so let me share, and I'm happy um, if if you guys have any question, please stop me at any time. This is more of a discussion i would say rather than a direct presentation if if anything comes up and uh, any questions stop me so um uh thank you for a great introduction as, as um liana was mentioning uh we're going to talk about multidisciplinary tumor board uh and i i figured that that might not be a full time of of the presentation and at the end i had a, a small um part talking about ctDNA and how we've been utilizing that here, uh, but it, it, we probably cannot go through the whole thing. So I'm happy if there is a, um, it, you know, that the, the slides are given. So if you guys have any questions and we didn't finish the slide, please go ahead and please reach out to me if you have any question, more than happy to help. So um, these are the really the um, the outline of what we're going to be talking about a multidisciplinary tumor board. We'll talk about a little bit what is multidisciplinary tumor board, um, why is it important, and what can should be discussed. Okay, you guys can hear me well. Perfect. Well, let me start by just giving you a the definition of the National Cancer Institute of a multidisciplinary tumor board. It's, it's defined as a treatment planning approach in which a group of healthcare professionals who are experts in different specialty review and discuss the medical condition and treatment options um, of patients. So as, as exactly as this definition is, um, as you can indicate, a, a multidisciplinary meeting includes a variety of different specialists. And I have listed here uh, what I could remember, but um, there, depending on the tumor board that is involved, you can think that uh, some of these specialty may be added or less from this level. But from a GI perspective, um, uh, there's always a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, pathologist, radiologist, uh, surgeons, uh, surgical oncology, hepatobiliary, colorectal, you know, if you're thinking upper GI, thoracics. Uh, interventional radiology, palliative care, genetics, um, nursing, pharmacy, uh, and others. Uh, our meeting is weekly, and we focus on patient care and decision making. So, what does a multidisciplinary tumor board really accommodates and provides? Well, it accommodates review of complex cases, rare cases, cases truly with no clinical guidelines cases that we don't know truly what to do. The tumor board identify the clinical complexity and try to formulate a plan for many of these patients that we truly don't have a direct clinical guidelines or 
the case itself require a variety of different subspecialties. And what we need to know is figure out what is the best, let's say, sequencing of treatment. And I think one of the best um, uh, examples for that is really uh, looking at the complex management of rectal cancers, right? Um, Rectal cancer is a trimodality treatment where every patient might require a completely different path, although all three um, subspecialty need to be involved more or less, right? Uh, we're talking about radiation, we're talking about um, uh, surgery, and we're talking about medical oncology. But not to forget, again, imaging and pathology, the least of not social work, genetics, um, and and other groups that might be involved. So it, it is always very complex. Uh, and for us specifically, we tend to actually have all new cases of rectal cancer presented in our tumor board. Now, we also discuss evidence-based medicine because it's important to think about what is approved and what is not and how best to treat the patients. So um, even though these are uh, cases that may have not have a clinical guideline uh, basis, but the approach is always evidence-based. And we we share clinical expertise in decision-making, and that's a big one for us, right? We want um, all our uh, decisions to be really led by expertise and evidence-based medicine. So having our, our group uh, leaning on everybody from the providers in order to get that input in order to build the best plan for every patient. Now, um, what really the, the multi-disciplinary uh, tumor board provides really is, is really adherence to clinical guidelines and better system for quality review. We understand from the tumor board is how these complex cases should be um, treated, and then it are, allows us to understand future cases as to how to approach those as well. And, you know, a, a lot of times I get to hear that about, okay, so how does... How do you adhere to clinical guidelines if you have a case that doesn't have clinical guidelines? Well, every case has some uh, value in evidence-based medicine and expertise, and that's how we utilize that, um, that specific case. Now, the last point that I add here, um, um, I figured I will add it, but I was not sure of it because um, just to mention that actually one of the great things that tumor board provide is, is education. And in some tumor boards in the US, um, tumor boards can considered as a continuum medical education. So a lot of doctors in the US require to take courses, classes, have to be part of conferences as to show that they're continuing on a regular basis to take to, to learn medicine and, and get more education. And so as the tumor board provides different cases on a regular basis and and refresher of all the evidence-based medicine coming from radiation oncology, coming from surgery, coming from medical oncology, in many cases, um, tumor boards are considered uh, CME and, and docs can actually utilize that for their own benefits. So, Let's try to think about our own tumor board. So we talked about the different subspecialties that are involved. And so how does a tumor board go? Well, it usually starts by a clinical presentation, talking about medical history, oncological history, social history, family history. All those are important aspects of, of we think about how best to treat our patients. What is the optimal plan for that patient? Uh, we go through imaging and pathology. Uh, we review the latest imaging and latest pathology, but we need to have access to even earlier uh, imaging and path because sometimes the question becomes, do we see recurrence? Do we see new lesions? Uh, is this recurrence a new primary or a, or a recurrence of old uh, disease? So having access to the imaging and the pathology is very important and we lean a lot on our pathologists and our radiologists. We always try to address the specific clinical questions. And as you see, I talk about this. One of the difficulties in the tumor board is, you know, what can we address? Um, many of us will talk forever about cases because we enjoy it and we love our patients, but 
uh, the tumor board is limited by time. And so what is the question we're trying to answer is very important. So providing a specific questions helps the tumor board focus on what it needs to help with. Uh, opinions, it's important to have open access to all everybody to provide um, any questions that they have and provide any opinion they have as we discuss that case. And part of big important part I put in bad is really lesson learned and clinical challenges that we face on every case that we present. And utilizing the tumor board a way to actually learn from every case that we present in order to actually keep uh, us moving forward and provide the best care for our patients. So let's talk about a little bit about the data. There's a lot of studies that have been uh, published that show the big impact that multidisciplinary tumor board uh, support in safe and high quality care. Uh, many cases and presentation have shows that uh, disease stage could be reclassified uh, on in the tumor board. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we presented a case with pathology or a um, or, or imaging and uh, the actual stage of the disease it changed based on uh, our re-evaluation in the tumor board. Uh, that said, even diagnoses tend to actually change. Um, many times our pathologists are able to restain tissue uh, because they see something that they haven't, you know, they, ha they were not sure about. So it is always important for the tumor board, and this is published data. It's always important that tissue and imaging be evaluated by the subspecialists in the tumor board, that being the pathologist and the radiologist. Um, uh, creating uh, management of planned and recommendations. So that, that feeds into um, where the data is. And what we see from the data is the patient who presented in tumor board have higher rates of treatment. So when patients actually are presented, these patients are able to get their treatment, not only get the treatment, that they actually get it in a, in a shorter time span and they can adhere better to guidelines and improve cancer outcomes. And the data is very strong for that. Uh, I tried to get a little examples and in this case, I thought should I focus on GI, but I wanted to be even broader uh, for, for the sake of this one point is that, um, uh, did I lose the, are you guys still seeing my slide? The slides vanished. Right, let me try to share again. Yeah. Okay, they're back. All right, perfect. All right, so I try to kind of go beyond just um, our GI tumor board. And in this situation, um, I, I looked at different uh, publications that highlight the importance of tumor boards. So you can see this study from John Hopkins back in uh, 2021, looking uh, at neuro-oncology, where they actually saw about 60% patients had changed in their clinical management, and 20% had a changes in their imaging presentation. Uh, a study in Germany, in colorectal disease show a greater overall survival in patients who are presented in tumor board. And in the United Kingdom, uh, another study in colorectal cancer showing that um, patients who were presented in tumor board had increased use of MRI, increase in adjuvant chemotherapy, and improvement in the three-year overall survival. Now, all the studies are great. However, if we, we're gonna um, you know, be, be purists, we should look at all the studies and even though um, in many cases um, there are a lot of data showing the importance of tumor board, uh, the data is still completely inconsistent. And mainly because uh, most of the data tend to be retrospective and not prospective. Uh, there was a this great study back in 2016, a review that looked at 27 uh, studies and only 13 had a control group and only three were actually prospective. Nevertheless, I think uh, multidisciplinary tumor board provide a very high quality uh, care for patients, and, and that is very well documented um, beyond that. 
So uh, challenges, um, and, and this is something that uh, I deal with uh, on a daily day to day basis. So. Um, one um, is practically uh, volume of cases. How many cases do we see? How many cases should we present? How much time should we present each case? What what um, acuity does each patient have? Um, uh, is a tumor board meeting for one hour? Is a tumor board meeting for two hours? That makes a difference for how many cases you can present, how many cases you can review, and how much you can allocate to every case. Um, a, do we have access to the imaging and pathology on our own site? Uh, we don't want to go by reviews from outside. We prefer actually our own radiologist and pathologist. Uh, uh, is the presenter present? The presenter, did he or she meet uh, the patient in person? Uh, do we have a full documentation of the history that presented? Many times patients are presented by our proceduralists. Um, whether it's surgeons, radiation oncologists, uh, interventional radiologists, and maybe the patient is getting care um, at a different site for maybe medical oncology and coming for consideration of surgery or procedure. Do we have the full documentation to document truly the history and the symptoms that the patients have had and where they stand today versus where they were, I don't know, two months ago? So that provides a lot of challenges for us, and, and that is a constant struggle on every case that we present. Now, on that note, I would like to highlight um, um, the virtual tumor board because that have changed a little bit of some of these challenges that we have. Um, virtual tumor board really became a reality, you know, during and after the, the pandemic. It really, it's a, it's a great allocation uh, for healthcare resources during crisis time, and, and that was clear during the pandemic, and it continues. Nowadays, actually, most tumor boards in the US are actually fully virtual, and every time I meet colleagues, uh, I don't think uh, anybody wants to go back. We have uh, submitted many uh, surveys to our group here to see if anybody thinks we should go back to in-person meeting and, and unanimously um, people feel that maybe virtual tumor board is better and, and they like to continue with it. And that's the same case in, in a lot of institutions in the US. Interestingly enough, actually, early this morning, we had our tumor board at seven in the morning and that specific situation came up uh, where um, a lot of the providers were like, how about we meet maybe once a quarter at least? And really that because the two last points that I highlight on this slide that, you know, with virtual tumor board, there is not only for us, but actually across the US, there is a, a sense of decreased camaraderie and decreased interpersonal relationships. You know, when you meet somebody in person in the tumor board, you can discuss the case. And even after the, the tumor board, there's always little discussions that take part. Uh, and when it's virtual by the end of the meeting, it, it ends, so there is not that that communication. So there's always discussions about um, virtual and no virtual. But what great about virtual in a sense that one, it not only that it's great during time of crisis, but it actually improve adherence. Um, uh, a lot of tumor boards tend to be early. Our tumor boards are at seven in the morning, um, uh, almost every day of the week. We we have a variety of different tumor boards in GI. Um, so there's in GI by itself, there's about five different tumor boards. And so um, it provides adherence for people. A lot of our surgeons are actually in the OR and they actually log in from the OR as they're waiting for their case. Uh, other um, attendees are actually home because they're not in, um, in, in clinic that day or they're not in the OR that day, but they're still able to participate from their homes. It also improves uh, collaboration with providers in distant sites uh, and rural cancer care, right? Uh, a lot of uh, docs, like I said, uh, a lot of patients get treated locally away from the cancer center, and it's important to get input from their own docs. And so it makes it easy for everyone actually to log in and get direct contribution to these cases. So it provides a big benefit from that uh, situation and and really becomes a more um, global 
um, care rather than actually have one person only present the case that knows the patient. So uh, at the end here, um, I, I thought um, I'll take you through our own tumor board and the challenges that we deal with as, as you think about your own tumor board and how to do it. Uh, and that really starts weeks before the tumor board is. Uh, you know, it, it starts with case organization. Uh, it starts with providers submitting cases. Uh, many times, actually, we get uh, patient uh, requests for tumor board uh, even months in advance sometimes because they know the patient's on a schedule, and by the time the schedule and the patient need to be presented urgently, and so we have cases being added uh, weeks in advance. Uh, so we have to organize these cases in advance. Uh, that said, we need to make sure that we obtain imaging and pathology. Uh, we need to make sure that the imaging and the pathology is available for our pathologists to review. Um, in our institution, we try to at least give our, our radiologists and pathologists at least two days to review the cases. Actually, every case uh, is reviewed prior to the tumor board. Our pathologist and radiologist actually go through every case. They go through their own history, case review. They look at uh, our notes. Uh, and so they're uh, very familiar with the case before the case is presented. So um, we try a, as hard as we can, unless there's an urgent case, which happens sometimes, we try to give them two days to review the cases before. But we, in, the, in that matter, we want to make sure that we actually have the imaging and the pathology available by the time the case is uh, going to be sent to the radiologist and pathologist. The number of cases is a big challenge for us. Um, our tumor board is one hour, and we have tried over the years to figure out what the best number for cases. And for now, we try to do eight cases per hour. We feel that that gives enough time at least to review the eight cases, but give each case enough time uh, for it to be reviewed and everybody's opinion uh, taken under consideration. So. Sometimes some case might need 15 minutes, sometimes case might need five minutes. So that's a big part of really management of cases and, and knowing what the time frame uh, for cases to present. Um, making sure on my part that I have representation from all subspecialties. Um, conferences, meeting and other obligations happens to all of us. And, and many times there might be a surgical conference where my surgical colleagues are not here. Uh, there might be meetings or other obligations that um, uh, basically uh, may deem one of the, you know, one of the subspecialties not available, and that's a problem because you want to make sure that uh, everybody from every subspecialty is there so that we can provide uh, the best um, recommendation that we can and get everybody's opinion about cases. So the cases starts with the basic demographics. We talk about the history of, as I talked about, we review the imaging and the pathology. And then as we go through the case, um, we have to make sure that there's a presenter available to present the case. Somebody who's aware of the patient and the case. We wanna make sure that we're getting all the history because many of us have not heard the case, have not met the patient. So it's important to make sure that somebody's aware of the case and available to present the case go through a variety of, of images. Uh, we go through MRIs, um, CT scans, PET scans, pathology. Many times a recommendation would be to repeat imaging because we might need better, you know, CT scan might not have helped us and, and we're looking at small lesions in the liver. We might need a PET scan or an MRI and then our radiologists recommend that. From a pathology perspective, more and more now, we're, we're looking not only about histology, but actually we're looking about molecular diagnostics. We're looking at uh, next generation sequencing um, because it is, especially in GIs, you know, it, it's actually becoming a bigger, bigger leading part of decision making as we go through the process. So uh, it would be great if we have, uh, you know, next generation sequencing as we present these patients. 
And then uh, the discussion uh, talking about uh, diagnosis, surgical planning, medical planning, coordination of care. And that's uh, falls on um, me in a sense in the, in the meeting and, and whoever is moderating that day is really time management. Uh, that's the toughest part for me, to be honest. Many times as we discuss cases, you want to be, you know, you want to give each case it's, it's, it's time to, to be fully reviewed, but in the same time, you don't want to ignore other cases. So sometimes you're trying to kind of manage the conversation, provide questions, uh, add comments, uh, and, and move the case along as discussion sometimes, as we all do, veer you know, into one direction versus the other. And that's where the question is important. What is the question for the tumor board? So that we can keep the conversation focused on how best to um, help the patients and, and the question that is being provided. And then uh, involving other providers, right? Uh, so a lot of times, you know, um, we want not only our senior docs to be involved, we want our junior faculty to actually weigh in. Expertise is important, but we also want everybody to be involved in these decisions. So it falls on me actually to push people through that process um, and ask more and more questions. And finally, uh, uh, I think uh, is documentation uh, ensuring that the patient uh, will be notified of the decision of the tumor board. Uh, the one thing I would say about documentation is that it is a tumor board slash institutional preference. There are many uh, tumor boards that don't directly document in the medical records. Uh, it would be better to do so that way that leaves a trail to what the decision is and that helps other providers who maybe did not attend or at least it leaves a direct recommendation. And then uh, making sure that the this decision is basically um, communicated to the to the patient themselves and know what the tumor board recommendations are. Okay. And that's it for the for that part. Um, I'm happy to take questions. It is uh, uh, I think it's the best part of my day tend to be the tumor board as uh, as it is the most um, anxiety provoking as I have to manage um, everybody and, and make sure that all the cases go through, but it is the most education part of the week. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you, Prof Kadosh. We have six hospital groups here and there might be some variation of practice. So I would like each of them to ask you the question. Can we begin with uh, group C, please? Group C, BPK, Right. Uh, yeah, thanks for your um, excellent talk. Um, uh, I, I would like to ask a simple question. I think, I'm not sure if, if uh, uh, it's the regulation from your institution that all of the cases, all cancer cases, uh, must be discussed in the tumor board be beforehand? That's a good question. Um, we don't discuss all cases. So um, from a rectal perspective, we do. And we do that because of an uh, accreditation that we're trying to maintain. Um, we are in excellence, a center of excellence for rectal cancer, and we're trying to maintain that accreditation. As part of that, we present all new cases in rectal cancer, but not all cases need to present. So uh, a lot of cases uh, that we think that are not multidisciplinary. So, uh, you know, a lot of time you maybe see uh, patients with, you know, bread and butter stage three you know, metastatic colon cancer or a stage through, uh, sorry, stage three colon cancer or a, or a metastatic patient colorectal cancer that don't need a multidisciplinary, really, maybe it's medical oncology and, and surgery. And these cases don't usually get presented. But if, if one feels that, um, let's say, uh, there is a path to resection, there's a path to a more multidisciplinary approach, we try to present these cases uh, a lot of times 
for example, metastatic colorectal cancer with liver meds that could be a path for resection, these cases get presented in tumor report. Right, and um, if, for example, rectal cancer, uh, some of the rectal cancer cases, uh, the, the attendings are not um, presenting in the tumor board, what, what's going to happen in, in your institution? Yeah, so if a case, um, you know, we're very close and um, people tend to uh, um, communicate quite often. So for rectal cancer, uh, most of the cases get presented. But if a case is not presented in the tumor board, uh, many times we communicate directly with each other uh, between, you know, colorectal surgery, uh, radiation oncology, medical oncology, uh, there we have actually a nurse navigator that helps us, but we also communicate very closely. So there, you know, there's always emails going and and phone calls going between all three services to make sure that the patient is getting the appropriate plan of treatment and everybody is uh, in sync with what the plan should be. And, and the, the, la the, the last question for now, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Eliana. Uh, yeah, uh, if if uh, the case is presented already in the tumor board and then uh, there's a consensus or like recommendation for, from the tumor board and but the attending surgeons or um, medical oncologists not following that recommendation, what, what's going to happen? Very, very good and tough question. Uh, the tumor board recommendation is just a recommendation, right? Uh, we, we, it's not obligatory for anybody truly to follow the recommendation of the tumor board. It is, it is really a best practice. Uh, and so if, if, um, a provider feels that, um, maybe a decision is not to follow it, that is okay. Uh, if they feel that. That's the right thing to do. You know, sometimes if, if somebody goes to surgery, things change during surgery. Uh, what we thought, what we saw on imaging might not be what you truly see while you're doing the procedure. And so at that point, it, it is absolutely appropriate to, to transition the plan in that moment. And just to interject a little bit about the rectal cancers are, I mean, we're trying to be an RPC and you have to present even straightforward cases. The role of tumor board is when they're not straightforward and you don't know what to say and you want some guidance from your colleagues, but also how you approach the patient. There's so many times that it can have it that has happened. The tumor board will make a recommendation. The patient may not agree with the tumor board recommendation, and then you have to just change your plan and go according to the patient wishes. So the tumor board has helped us actually having those very difficult discussions sometimes with patients that may not accept the stoma. And when they come and they see me in clinic, they say, well, no way in APR, you know, and I say, okay, well, this is my recommendation. I'll present you to tumor board. And then I go to tumor board. We review everything. I get like 20. As I, as I tell all my patients, I get 20 more biases and I just, we just form a consensus and I go back to the patient and the patient, if it doesn't still does not agree again, they don't, you know, we, it's just a recommendation. See, even, and, even in medical oncology where, you know, the patient have, was seen by surgery or radiation oncology, and now the tumor board recommended a, a path and the patient shows up and he's there like, um, I don't want chemo. And so. It, it is, it's, yeah, it happens often, to be honest. Uh, patients are unpredictable. Thank you for a uh, detailed explanation. Can I ask Pia Tai to group five? Do you have any question for the speaker? Okay. Group five doesn't have. Group four, BKH team, I have seen you. Okay, group three, Pataya. No more question. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Ajahn Manita, group two. How do you want to share the experience here? Your incident 
sorry, uh, can you louder the microphone? But not 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 well. Can can you change the mode of the microphone? Speaker mode is better. Okay, is it better? Is it better now? Guy, is guy hearing me now? Um, anyone can hear? I, I can hear you. It's a little bit low, but we can hear you faintly. Okay, okay. I will try to. I will try to like okay. increasing the voice. Okay. Uh, here in Tibet Hospital, we I want to share experience. So we try to do tumor conference. So maybe four or five years now. It's a bit by my senior doctors, Dr. Pitula. So we do have it every Wednesday morning. Uh, we try to recruit as much as doctor that uh, involving in this and that patients. So basically, there are GI doctors who are taking care of patients, um, surgeon, oncologist, radiologist. Uh, we try to discuss the difficult cases or complicated cases in in. In the most cases, but um, the uh, the easy one or not complicated one, uh, we normally calling personally um, to the surgeon or oncologist. So my challenge here is that, um, as um, Dr. A say, we uh, have varieties of uh, management in each case and variety of doctors. So the choice of treatment might be not using opinion from tumor boarding. Some some doctors try to like okay they have their own opinions or um, the patients doesn't want to do as the way that it should be so that that was our experience. And I I think one of the issues that could help and 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 this is coming from somebody who's who's moderating at least and make sure that everybody is on is having all the stakeholders actually present in the tumor board. So that way everybody can give their opinion. For example, if you have a case and you have, you need the medical oncologist and the radiation doc, uh, it's easier if everybody who's taking care of the case is present on the discussion. So that way they can present their opinion at that point rather than, you know, making a decision without that person being there and then that provider have a different um, recommendation. If the patient changed their recommendation, that's different. That's that's patient preference, we cannot, we cannot, you know, we can recommend to the patient what is the right choice, but we cannot dictate care. But it's easier when you have all the stakeholders are actually involved in that decision because then the discussion becomes more open. And uh, sometimes, you know, if, if somebody have a different opinion, then that opinion could either be changed in that discussion or that chain that opinion could become really what the recommendation comes up to be if it's if it's follow guidelines or you know evidence based so mm -hmm. uh i think having ev you know I, I think you're doing a great job by getting everybody involved uh but the more people that are involved specifically in the cases being presented it makes actually adherence to the decision more in that sense mm -hmm. at least from a provider perspective so right now you're doing virtual meetings every Thursday or interpersonal meeting for tumor board right now. Yeah, right now what we do is only virtual. Uh, I think I'm going to try to do a quarterly meeting. Uh, so once every three months we'll meet in person just because everybody wants that interactions with everybody. Uh, kind of I have young faculty that have not met surgeons in person. Right, uh, because everybody is so, and we, you know, our institution has a little bit separation physically, mm -hmm. and so it makes it difficult. And so uh, the goal is to get everybody together at least once every three months. But for now, everything is virtual, which makes it easy because uh, you know, even if 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 somebody's sitting at home, uh, actually, one of my docs joked that he was joining 
the meeting this morning in their pajamas. And so uh, <laughs> it makes it it makes it easy for everybody right. to be involved. OK, uh, we, uh, we try virtual um, during COVID and I don't think it's uh, working pretty good. Um, I think we need maybe need more like interpersonal meetings so that we can discuss. We can like see body language and see the, what they's opinion about. So thank you so much for the opinion. Yeah, I, to be honest, I completely agree with that uh, body language. One of the things I was hoping for is that when people present, maybe they will turn their cameras on. Uh, that did not go so well from at least um, a survey. I guess a lot of pe more people than I thought would be in their pajamas. So, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but so far, I mean, at least for us, because of maybe historical a lot of people are, are seem to be very involved in it and it's working well, at least for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. I have seen Dr. Pitulak in the video call as well. You have any question for him too? Uh, I don't have any question. I just have something to share as well. Uh, we try, uh, can you hear me? Very well. Uh, okay. So actually we try a lot for the past, I think five, Oh, no, maybe six, six, seven years to set up the Zoom conference, uh, like Dr. Venita said. But I have two questions because our hospital has no uh, limitation of the area, so we don't have the radiotherapy, uh, uh, which can uh, can provide to the patient by ourselves. So whenever it comes to the radiation treatment, we always are a little bit stuck. We have the oncologist who give us the opinion, but we don't have the radiologist, uh, the radiotherapist who, who can share the opinion. Uh, so we, we are talking about is it possible that the BHQ can provide uh, some kind of uh, someone who can join our conference. Uh, because a part of the patient management, I think we also get a lot of knowledge from the tumor conference in our hospital. And the second thing is that we, if we would like to, uh, to include more doctors to join this activity, uh, what we did now is that we make it like a CME for our uh, doctors who join the this activity. But is it possible to make it like a kind of a performance evaluation, a personal performance evaluation for the one who who uh, involved? Or uh, if it seems to be more uh, <laughs> stri strict to, to the doctor. Okay, thank you. That's um, actually a great idea for continuing medical education, to be honest, because um, <clears throat> same for us, we, we are bound by it and uh, we go every week. So we talked about this. It's, it's not as easy, but yet uh, a lot of tumor boards do that and, and that benefits everybody who goes. That's a smart idea. Thank you, Dr. Pitulak, and I hear your wish list to Dr. Tirawood at Vatanosot. Jan Tirawood, you are the last car, and you were mentioned. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carlos. Very uh, clear uh, presentation. I have some questions and some comments about uh, the question that asked by Dr. Vanilak. First, I want to, to share some idea that now in uh, our cancer hospital, what to know? So we have uh, three times of the we call the tumor conference. Maybe I will share in the <laughs> next week to the multidisciplinary tumor board. This is the maybe the general word because we use the tumor conference. This is the old word in Thailand, okay? And we have three times a week, and we also have the consultation from the the astrophysics of the uh, cancer center, right? Who get or not call us in my so Dr. Pitulat, don't hesitate to join us three times a week. And we also have the uh, another meeting we call the biomolecular tumor board. This is only for the next gen uh, sequencing uh, management because we sometimes we have some, uh, the category three we call the valiant, that's not significant. So we treat this kind of patient to what we have to document in the tumor bar. So I have some question to Dr. Cardos that 
because we have some limited number of oncologists in Thailand. Now our tumor boss is the general one. Do you have the specific cancer tumor board in OSSU? This is the first question. And concerning about the documentation, uh, do you do do you put the tumor board documentation into the medical record? Because this is we will have some issue about legal issue. If we have some problem about the list, they will use this one for the in the court. So, do you have any problem about this? So I, I will start great questions. Great questions. Actually, I will start with the last one. And the answer is. Yes, mostly um, it depends on the institution. So uh, different tumor boards in the US. Um, have decided to do documentation differently. Some tumor boards actually leave a direct document in the medical records. And other tumor boards have left it to the provider who's presenting the patient to decide to leave a, a tumor board recommendation. And that's exactly the reasoning for it. And that is because from a medical legal perspective, uh, tumor boards note could be um, have a lot of uh, legal legal uh, complications when it comes to now to, to cases, but in in different institutions, they have decided, for example, in OHSU, uh, a tumor board record is considered undiscoverable, meaning it is not released to the patients and it's not directly released to a medical legal case. Um, unless there's specific specific cases, but in the most part, our institution have created illegality to protect the tumor board from a kind of legal uh, lawsuits. So our our notes are undiscoverable in that sense. But other institutions, it might be, and therefore the decisions to leave a documentation or not leave a documentation, it's really based on the institution and the group themselves. So that's a great, great question. Uh, one of the, at least from a, from a tumor board, the question about subspecialization tumor board, um, it, you're right. Uh, we have a specialized tumor board. For example, in GI at OHSU, uh, we have five different tumor boards. We have upper GI tumor board. We have uh, pancreatic tumor board, we have liver tumor board, which is basically hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. We have neuroendocrine tumor board, and we have colorectal tumor board. So because of the amount of cases we see, we, we have opted to kind of separate the, the tumor boards into five different tumor boards. And that is a challenge because then we have to separate our Docs, surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists to cover all these different tumor boards, which happen on a weekly basis. Basis. We don't have directly a molecular tumor board. Other institutions in the U.S. do have a molecular tumor board. Uh, my previous institution at Stanford has a molecular tumor board. But what we have done in our tumor board, in at least from a colorectal perspective, is that we actually review. Uh, the NGS, and we have a geneticist as part of our group every time we present cases. So that helps us decide how best to approach these cases uh, and cover for that specificity with regards to uh, the molecular aspects of, of treatments. But these are very good questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to share the perspective when I worked in Singapore some years ago, they have uh, an act called PHMC Act, which determine which kind of document is for under category of medical review. And if it is, it is protected from being called call upon the external request by the court and by the, uh, the other party lawyer. So just want to share the idea. So it's like similar with OHSU that is not uh, not 
appear in the medical record and it's out of reach for the uh, to prevent from legal complication. So they they feel that it is uh, to lessen the worry for quality perspective and if uh, anything happened, uh, the provider are not uh, fully discussed in great length. So that's why they have this PHMC Act to to address this issue. So that that's what I want to share. And anyone have a question before we finish? I, I would like to ask this about this uh, this point about the legal issue. As I am the clinician and also the administrator, uh, if we have the legal issue about the case, uh, oncology case, we as the administrator we will consider the tumor conference, uh, the tumor board as one of our reference that the hospital will help the doctor or not. If they bring the case to the tumor board or they follow the tumor board or not, this is our consideration about this. This is maybe in the future, if you have the, uh, the problem with the patient and don't bring the uh, patient, the case to the tumor board, the hospital will not help the, the physician in, in every aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think pretty much, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, uh, before we wrap up, there are many more slides on CTDNA within that presentation that we did not have the chance to, to go, Dr. Kardosh did not have the chance to go over. Uh, but the slides are there. And if we want to arrange another talk on CTDNA, maybe we can do that, Dr. Kardosh? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if you find that this is of value to you, definitely we'll do it. But before we close, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. There was a request from me to go over our order sets. I have an epic chart open and I don't want to violate HIPAA, but I was thinking the best way I could do it is I can give you our order sets for post-op order sets because there were there were some questions from a prior uh, a prior session on how we normalize of how patients are followed within the hospital and um, and it was a request about um, a, a talk on this on postoperative uh, recovery. But I think our order sets, and I'm more than happy to share them with the team. I just need to to take a. I can show you in Epic. Uh, we have a build Epic sets. And I'm not sure which EMR system you use, but in any EMR system, I would expect that you can build all order sets. And particularly when it comes to colorectal um, care, um, our uh, nurse practitioners that are inpatient nurse practitioners, they have helped us build those order sets that cover everything from hygiene to diet to mobility to um, drain, you know, care if they need drains, we rarely use them, uh, to stoma care, and particularly when they get discharged from the hospital, we have particular postoperative orders. And I know this came up in the last discussion. I don't know if it's a worthwhile for an hour discussion, but I'm more than happy to take some pictures of those order sets and share them with you if you think that will be useful. You don't need to let me know right now. Uh, you can let me know through an email. I'm more than happy to do that because it came up from our prior talk. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up, we are extremely excited to be visiting you um, like in three weeks, <laughs> time flies. Yes, yes, uh, yes. We are extremely excited. And I want to make sure we, our talks that we have uh, um, to, get, to give, because there was an, um, a colorectal conference that is not happening is on benign disease. Mine is on diverticular disease. Uh, Kim Luz, who is on the call, I know he's somewhere on the call, uh, is on inflammatory bowel disease, the surgical management for those processes. And, uh, and the other one was asked on personalized colon cancer care. And I find that we have covered that topic, that second topic. And I was thinking if there's any other topic you want us to cover instead of that, if you want to let us know, and we're more than happy, Kim and I, to prepare it. And we can give it while we're there. Um, Prof, only three weeks left. We dare not ask you to share anything 
it takes the effort for you to prepare. So we will go ahead with with the topics that you already have on your hand. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. It's okay. only three weeks left, so we don't want to cost you any more. You're not costing us anything. You're not costing, <laughs> costing us any, any headache or any <laughs> more time spent behind the scene. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it, what is whatever you think it will be most of benefit to you. Um, and as I said, I can take screenshots of our epic order sets. Uh, Brita also in her talk um, will talk a lot about postoperative care after discharge because you know it continues for quite some time. It doesn't go like by the time they leave the hospital, we, you know, recovery does not end there. Um, but I wanted to make sure that if anything else is needed or you think it will be, it's not that difficult for me and Dr. Lou to, to do, you know, prepare something that you think it will be of most uh, benefit to you. Um, we're we're no. excited to learn. We are so excited. We can't yeah, wait yeah. to see you operating. <laughs> so, so first arena, we are now really interesting about the servo ship. So we try to set up the servo ship program in our hospital. So oh fellowship. And, Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you know, why won't the expert here? Kim Lu is our program director of the Colorectal Fellowship. You can get all the information you want from Kim Lu. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, thank you very much. Um, we reached the time and we are thankful for Dr. Kadosh for practical talk to all of us and inspire to, to revise our MDT colorectal tumor board. Dr. Liana for kindly offer a number of things and we'll see you in next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Take so, care. Take care. Much. Thank you Bye. all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Good to see everyone. Cup on cup.